Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Jamf and their Jamf Now software that helps you manage your Apple devices from anywhere. Get started by setting up your first three devices free at jamf.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're back with Mr. Joe Kissel again. Joe, it's great to see you, as always. Always nice to be here. And, and the hair is now maintaining a steady tone. I like this. Yeah, you know, I mean, it it, it ebbs and flows. Okay, know? okay. That's, um, never heard of that of a hair, but, with a hair color, but we'll go for it. You know, uh, it, I, I, I wash it a few times and it sort of gets lighter and put some more stuff in it. It gets purpler and... Yeah. Uh, sometimes my my hairdresser or I will do additional things to make it extra vibrant or or do other little experiments. Uh, but you know, I, I I've I've said before it's not always going to be purple, but I'm kind of digging it right now. I, I like I mean, what one person might say it sucks to have purple hair because you walk down the street and people laugh at you. Another person might say it's great to have purple hair because you walk down the street and you make people smile. <laughs> and I would fall into the latter category. I, I, I like making people smile. Yeah. So well, as long as there's no radiation involved, I'm good with it. Hardly any. Great. <laughs> Hardly any. Good. Good. Well, I guess I get to be one of the first to congratulate you on the sixth edition of Take Control of iCloud. That's impressive. Yeah. It, well, yes. Yeah. So a couple of things about that. Um, this is <laughs> this is our first sixth edition. Say that five times fast. Um when I when I bought Take Control books, uh, Adam and Tanya warned me. Now our system has only been designed to accommodate five editions of of books. So if you ever get to edition six, you are either going to have to rename that book something else, or you're going to have to hire a programmer to update our infrastructure to be able to handle six plus editions. And that's what I did. Um, so the the the, it, there, 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 it, it wouldn't have been possible to uh, accommodate six editions had we not done uh, some all kinds of database and, and website work and so forth. But anyway, mm -hmm. sixth edition, of course, you know, this is six editions of the iCloud book after several editions of the mobile me book after the dot Mac book. So this, you know, this lineage has been going back a really long time. And, um, you know, I, I mean, we've been doing the upgrading titles for longer, but I think this is the the longest running sort of single sequence of like, you know, some some of the knowledge gets passed on every time, and it's 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 essentially the same title, but you know, refreshed every year. So we've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Well, it's it's great, and the fact that there are six editions means that iCloud has continued to evolve and hopefully improve. And I know in the early days we've had a number of conversations about how iCloud was not the best cloud option out there for a lot of things, and and now it has definitely grown up, and it's a whole lot better. But in, during our pre-show, we said something interesting um, that that Apple users, Mac users, have to use iCloud. Do we have to use iCloud? You don't have to have to, but if you want to use quite a lot of the you know the features built into Mac OS, iOS, and other OSs, then you kind of do. I mean, nobody has to use, for example, an iCloud.com email address. If you don't want to use that email account, don't use it, no problem. You don't have to use the calendar syncing, if you'd rather use Exchange or Google Calendars, you can. Nobody's nobody's forcing you to do that. But there are some parts of what iCloud does that there really aren't any other – there aren't other services that do quite the same thing or quite well enough or in quite the same way. And if you want to have those capabilities, and I think most of us probably do, this is the way you do it. I mean – iCloud can sync your credentials for all your different accounts, you know, your different email accounts and Google and um, Outlook and all these all these different kinds of accounts, Yahoo, across your Macs. Now you can you can get all those accounts on different computers without that syncing, or you can just put them all in some kind of a plain text file or an email or something that will sync another some other way. 
But if you want all these accounts to actually be set up automatically on all of your devices, iCloud is the way to do it. Similarly, there are lots of other ways of syncing passwords. You know, there's one password, there's LastPass, and a bunch of others. But if you want your Wi-Fi passwords to sync, your like system level passwords, uh, the stuff that will allow you to just log into another network without doing anything at all, except ha you know being in proximity to the right device, then you're going to use iCloud Keychain for that. And so there are there are a bunch of parts of iCloud that are like that, where it's not like Apple's not twisting your arm; they're not forcing you to do it, but they are sort of they want to tempt you by saying. Wouldn't your life be so much easier if you did this? And wouldn't you be able to take advantage of all these great features in our in our four different platforms by doing this? And by the way, it's free, so why wouldn't you do this? And so, yeah, sure, there are people who don't use iCloud or who hardly use it at all or who only use, you know, just this little corner here and this little corner up here. But um, it for all practical reasons, for all practical purposes, being an Apple user pretty much means you're being an iCloud user. And I didn't mean to imply that that's a bad thing. Hmm. It was just, I'm not sure I ever really thought about that, that, okay, we have to use iCloud. It, it As you said so eloquently, it, it, it adds a lot of functions to our our Apple ecosystem devices because that's really yeah. what it's become. So yeah, you know. and of, and of course we we we've talked about all kinds of cloud stuff in the past. And you know, I use Dropbox. You know, I use One Password, and I use uh, you know Google Docs for some stuff, and I use Backblaze for some stuff. You know, like I use different things for different things. And so it's not like I'm some Apple fanboy that would only ever use the Apple thing. Like no, I use I use whatever the appropriate tool for the job is. Um. And, and I would be the first person to tell you that there are certain things that you should not use iCloud for, that it just, it's, you know, round peg, square hole kind of thing. And I talk a lot about that in my book, but uh, I, I, I do think that there are some things that it does exceptionally well. And, uh, and for those things, I'm all for it. So given that there's a new edition, six or not, means that there have been some changes, significant changes to iCloud, because you don't just put new numbers on the books for fun. Um, and yet, it doesn't feel like... It is like, kind of fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does feel like, though, that iCloud, for the most part, feels like it did maybe a year or so ago. So what what kind of changes precipitated a new edition? Yeah, I mean, iCloud has felt fairly stable for a while. If you go to the iCloud website, you know, today versus a year ago, you're going to see the same set of apps there, and the apps are going to look very, very similar. I mean, I could say, well, yeah, but the, the web version of Pages has a few new features and some little preference over here, and one of these apps is different. Yeah, okay, there's stuff like that. But really, from, from that point of view, iCloud looks very much the same as it did before. If you look in system preferences and the iCloud pane and you don't look very carefully, um, it might look almost exactly like it did before. Same thing on iOS. So it, it, is, it is fairly stable, and most of the changes are not huge sweeping things. But as, as you and I have talked about, I can't tell you how many times before in, in, in different subjects, I mean, not just with iCloud, but other topics too, it, it comes to the point where I think, well, I wonder if I should update this book. It's been a while, you know, it's been a year. Let's, let's go and see what's new. And I have a little list of what's, what I think is different. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. You know, I can write about that stuff, but it's really no, no big deal. And then I start actually, I start writing and I start researching and I start testing out what all the new things are and looking in detail. I'm like, Oh, actually there's kind of a lot here. Um, and there were some things that, that weren't, it's not like, it's not like Apple released a new version of iCloud like they released a new version of Mac OS or iOS. It doesn't, doesn't happen like that. It's just that gradually over time, things change. And so when I take a break of a year between you know the last time I looked at it and now, and, and I, I notice all those things are different since, since last time, well, that's kind of an interesting list. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, you know, a while back, Apple changed... They, they now have a two terabyte storage plan as their top tier. It used to be one terabyte. The two terabyte plan is the same cost that one terabyte used to be. So that's really nice. Not a huge, I mean, it's a huge change in the sense that they're giving you twice as much storage for the same price. 
Other than that, it's not a really big deal. What is new as of iOS 11 and High Sierra is that if you if you're paying for extra storage above like not the lowest like 99 cents a month level but anything beyond that if you're paying for that and you have an iCloud family sharing account you can share that extra storage among your family so that's really cool for me because I've been paying for some extra storage and my wife has been paying for extra storage separately and now we can combine that and just as a family pay for one block of extra storage and and that's really handy Again, it's not like an earth-shattering thing. It's just, well, that's nice. You can just save a little bit of money and, and have a little bit more convenience there. Um, in, in, in this in a similar vein, uh, photos have been able to sync using iCloud Photo li Library for some time. That isn't new. What is new is that faces, that is the, the people album, and the facial recognition of who is in what photo can now sync across your devices. So you can, you know, open up your iPhone and say, no, this is this person and this is this person. And that information will sync back to your Mac and so forth. Uh, I've been wanting that for a long, long time. So that's really cool. Uh, there's the new Files app for iOS. And it used to be that you'd have an iCloud Drive app for iOS, and that's how you get out stuff, the files and folders on your iCloud drive. So Files uh, replaces that, and it does all the same stuff, but then in addition, it gives you the capability of integrating with Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive and all these other things. So that's really cool. Um, there are some additional pieces of information that will now sync across devices. Uh, Siri data can now sync via iCloud. So anything Siri learns about you on one device can be used on other devices. Uh, if you have an iPhone with a health app, you store health information in there, that can sync via iCloud. Um, supposedly, sometime soon, uh, iMessage conversations for messages will sync. That isn't really happening yet, and that was one of the features that Apple uh, promised us back at WWDC, so I'm kind of leaving a placeholder in the book. I, I think this is coming soon, but it, it hasn't yet. Um, and there are some changes to you know, iCloud keychain and two-factor authentication and uh, a few other little things. But um, it's not that anything is really earth-shattering so much as that there have been incremental improvements and some new stuff and lots of little changes that collectively make you kind of rethink some things. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Jamf Now. Jamf Now helps you manage your Apple devices from anywhere. Growing your business can be both fun and difficult, and the tech aspects of growing your business can be your biggest challenge. When you first start, it's pretty easy to keep track of your computer and phone. But you grow, have some success, and start to acquire more tech for your employees, and it gets harder to keep track of all those Macs, iPhones, and iPads. How do you secure that iPad that your sales rep lost especially when he's in one state and you're in another. That's where Jamf Now comes in. Jamf Now makes that, and a whole lot more, much easier. You can configure settings, protect sensitive information, even lock or wipe a device from anywhere. Your tech is secure so you can focus on your business. No IT expertise needed. You can start securing your business today by setting up your first three devices for free. Add more for just two bucks per month per device. That's an IT and security budget that anyone can afford. Create your free account today at jamf.com slash macvoices. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash macvoices. Give it a try now and sleep better tonight knowing your tech is secure. Thanks to Jamf for their support of Mac Voices. Regarding the Files app, I'm kind of yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that and how that's working. Um, because it seemed for a while that iCloud was sort of forcing you, uh, let's let's say to to if for the uh, the iWorks apps, for example, you know it it sort of encouraged you. It didn't quite force you, but it strongly encouraged you to store your stuff in iCloud, and then sync it across different devices. And then sometimes on your Mac you couldn't actually find the file, and it it was very confusing. And and then when you've got it on your your iOS device, okay, you kind of knew where it was, but you know, things going back and forth there didn't seem to be as good as they could have been. Has it leveled out a little bit, you think, at this point? Makes a little more sense, or I hate to say it, but acts a little more like Dropbox? 
Well, it does. So in addition to the fact that there's this new app and that it connects to these other services and apps, there are some some kind of subtle but but really wonderful changes in the behavior of just just saving and opening files. So this was something that um, I, I had I had previously written in the in the, in the old other, the old version of the book, the old edition of the book. How you know if you're used to Dropbox, then you might think that if you have a file from app A and you open it in app B, that this is what's going to happen, just sort of like the normal way you'd expect things to be opened and saved. But if you use iCloud Drive, then instead of what you expect to have happen, well, the, you know, the file is going to be copied to this other folder, and in there, or in some cases, it's going to make an alias, and it's going to, um, you know, sort of export and import and save the copy, but it's just like this whole twisted thing. And uh, so it's not really doing that weird dance anymore. It's just kind of behaving the way you expect it to behave now. Uh, not in every case, but but in more cases. So I, I feel like iCloud Drive is sort of becoming a better network citizen, if you will. Okay. I like that Apple is acknowledging that for years and years, Dropbox was the de facto iOS file system. You have some file that you want to be able to access in multiple different apps on your iOS device. Well, you're going to use Dropbox because almost every iOS app supported Dropbox. And and since iOS itself didn't give you a way to you know, get at like a, a local generic device-wide file storage, um, Dropbox was how people sort of worked around that. So, of course, you can still do that if you want, but now Apple is saying, okay, we, we, we get it. Uh, iCloud Drive wasn't entirely scratching that itch for you. It maybe got you a little bit closer, but it wasn't really what everybody needed. So now with the Files app, we are, we are conceding that some people want to use different services for different reasons, and that's okay. You can use any of them, all of them, you can mix and match, and you, you can get at all of these things, not only from within this app, but also from within, you know, pages or numbers or whatever app that you're using on your iOS device, because most of them will use the kind of same document picker. And, and what one of the things that has been talked about very little but that I love is that in the Files app, it's not just iCloud Drive and Dropbox and your other cloud services, but there's also a local, uh, an on-my-device category. So you can actually see what files are stored just here and not in the cloud, and you can move stuff, and you can, uh, like, you can interact with it like, like an ordinary person interacting with an ordinary computer has been able to do for decades. So that's kind of neat. Um, so I, I, I appreciate what Apple was trying to do in terms of simplifying stuff. But I much more appreciate that they are recognizing that they're not the only game in town and that other people have other needs and trying to, you know, accommodate everybody. I, I think that's really, really helpful. You mentioned that health data is syncing now through iCloud. Is that a good thing, Joe? Is that a secure thing? Is it something that I should be worried about? <laughs> Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. It's weird. So there is a health app on your iPhone. There isn't a health app on your iPad. There isn't a health app on your Mac. There isn't a health app at iCloud.com. Now there's a switch in the iCloud settings on your iOS device on your on your iPhone that says sync health data or don't. So you can turn it on, and I guess if you have two iPhones that it'll sync between them. I don't, I don't know anybody who has two iPhones. So it's a little bit unclear to me what the intention of this syncing is other than for that rare type of person. Maybe I'm missing something really obvious that is possible and it definitely wouldn't be the first time. But since I can't yet figure out how else I can get at that data from a Mac or a PC or the web, um, unless, you know, it could be that third-party apps do, and I just haven't encountered them yet, so fine. But um, for or if you're just using Apple stuff, the, the, the issue of security is sort of much less inter interesting to me than the issue of why do you even care. Um, but let's, let's say that you do care and you do have some third-party app that really needs that data to sync, and it does sync, and it does work. 
So now there's the the question of of privacy and security. Apple does a pretty good job of encrypting data, and uh, like you know, like most big companies, they encrypt it in such a way that they could decrypt it if they had to. So when we've talked about things like, you know, sending files with Dropbox, and I, I say, well, it's encrypted, but it's encrypted in a way that you don't really care about in that, you know, if Dropbox got hacked or Dropbox got a court order or a subpoena or something, you know, was compelled in some way, legally or otherwise, they could get at your data. So if you really want your stuff in Dropbox to be encrypted, you have to encrypt it separately. So, it, you know, it's kind of the same thing with, with iCloud Drive. In terms of the health data, I don't personally use, I don't personally put data into the health app that is, that I regard as being sensitive, like I record my weight in there, and okay, maybe I wouldn't like some other people to see those certain (laughs) spikes, but whatever, you know, it, it knows how many steps I've walked and stuff like that, but I mean, for the way I use the health app, which is really, really minimal, um, none of the stuff that I put in there would be a privacy concern for me. Now, if you have some, you know, special medical condition or something that you do record uh, much more private or personal information in there, um, I wouldn't be so concerned about the fact that it's syncing to the cloud. I would be a little bit concerned about what another app or another vendor might do if they have access to it. And I'm, I'm going to have to plead ignorance here because I just don't know what's possible with that data. All I know is that there's the switch now. And so the infrastructure is there for some sort of syncing. I, I ask just because I was really surprised when you mentioned that. It kind of caught my attention because I know that one of the key things when you're migrating from watch to to phone or to a new watch, new phone, all that is make sure you do you you follow this prescribed procedure to make sure that things are backed up, because especially with your phone, because that's where your health data is stored, and if you don't, you could accidentally lose it. Okay, so then you're right. Then if it's if it's being backed up to iCloud, do I have a chance to recover it? Um, and I, I realize that's you know a, a little bit off topic, but that's where I was going with that question. Yeah, so. I, I I don't know the answer to that, um, and I, my guess is probably yes. It's not something that I have actually ever needed to look into personally. Um, I'm I'm constantly asking myself, and people are constantly asking me, why did Apple do this? <laughs> And usually it's in the context of something that they really don't like. Why did Apple do that? <laughs> and I, 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 I've said many times, it, it's it's futile to, answer, to, to ask why when it comes to Apple, because I sure don't know. And Apple hates answering that question. They just want for their objects and their software to exist as these pieces of art. And Apple, like David Lynch does not want to answer, what does this mean? They just want it to, to exist in its weird, beautiful glory, and you take it or leave it. But um, wh- why did they make this decision? What do they hope to accomplish with it? Don't know. Okay. Sorry. No, it's it's not a bad thing. you know. And, and, and sometimes we get impatient because we think that we're seeing the entire picture and the, and the picture is as it will always be. And two weeks from now, two months from now, sometimes longer, something happens and you look back and say, oh, that's where they were going with this. But we weren't privy to it. So, For sure. And, and I get quite upset at people who get upset without really at least considering the possibility that there is an, a, a means or an, an end to the means. But that's you, usually we we eventually find out what the reason was. Yeah. Usually, yeah. but it could be a while, and it's yeah. not always. Joe, I don't want to have the interview take too long, too too negative a turn. But I will ask this: Is there anything in iCloud as it stands right now, as you release this book, that you're less than comfortable using or you don't think is a good idea to use? You said you mentioned some things in the book and we don't need a a detailed list, but is there anything specifically that I should stay away from? 
I, I wouldn't say there's stuff you need to stay. Well, I, okay, I, there there are two things that I want to bring up actually, both of which have been very much discussed recently on Twitter. So the first thing, uh, I, I I know John Gruber was tweeting about this, and I don't know if he started this or if uh, or if he came in later in the conversation. But there was this whole discussion about text replacements. So, uh, you know. Uh, Mac OS and iOS have this thing built in that's kind of like text expander or type it for me where you type an abbreviation and it expands it into whatever you want. And you can set this up in system preferences and it's system wide. It's not fantastic, but it's free and it's built in. And one of the things that iCloud does is to sync those snippets across your devices. You put them on your Mac and then they show up on your iOS device and so forth. Well, this, this syncing feature has always been sucked. It just always worked very, very poorly, if at all. And I personally have experienced on, I can't tell you how many occasions, like I'll go through and I will, I'm like, you know, I've got like dozens, hundreds of, of, of things in here I don't need anymore. So I just delete them all. And I delete them. I like check all of my devices. Yep. They're deleted here. They're deleted on my iPad and my iPhone, my other Mac. And then six months later, I'll install something on some device and I open up system preferences. <sighs> And they've all reappeared. Like somehow they were just hanging out in the cloud waiting for an unknown event to occur. And then just there they are again. And now I have to delete them again. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll add something on one device and it doesn't sync to another device. And sometimes syncing happens that I don't want. So there's this whole discussion about this. And apparently Apple was using an old and unreliable framework for syncing that specific type of data and the the information came through the grapevine that Apple was working on switching to a newer framework, which wouldn't have those problems. And once this happens, and we hope a very short period of time, that syncing of those snippets will just work. So, so that's one thing. It's not, it's not that I would tell you to stay away from it so much as that you can't count on it <laughs> too heavily. So that's yeah. one thing. Okay, so the, the the second thing was there. It was it was revealed that there was this this exploit where basically if someone gets a hold of your uh, your iCloud password, then under certain circumstances they could lock you out of your Mac because they're going to use the find my Mac or find my iPhone or find my whatever device feature. And there was, there was a series of steps that they could go through to remotely lock your device. And then a little message would come up on the screen saying, you know, send such and such an amount in Bitcoin to this address and we'll unlock your computer. Uh, don't, and we won't. And so it was, it was this, it was a very clever exploit that made use of your iCloud password. And I, I imagine that Apple will fix this at some point. But when this was revealed that this, this has happened, that this exploit is possible, all these news sites were saying, so the lesson to, to learn, boys and girls, is don't use find my device. Don't, don't you know, turn off, find my Mac, find my iPhone, find whatever. Because if you have that turned on and somebody guesses your iCloud password, then even if you use two-factor authentication, which you should do, because there's this procedure that lets them bypass that and they can still lock your device and having two-factor authentication turned on won't help you. So the only thing you can do is to turn off find my whatever device. And when I read this, I, and I was not by any means the only person doing <laughs> it's like, you know, food can cause obesity, therefore don't ever eat. Like, well, <laughs> there's just so many things wrong with that advice. So, okay, number one, let us acknowledge this, this exploit exists. It's too bad. Um, Apple should have fixed it before. Let's hope they fix it soon. Okay, so that the, the, the problem is real, but... Um, turning off this security feature, which is designed to help you find and recover a lost or stolen device, is not the correct solution to this problem. I mean, 
the, the, the feature is there to help you. It is there for an important reason. It's there for your security. It's there to let you remotely lock or wipe a device that has gone missing. That's, real, that's a really important security thing to be able to do. So the fact that somebody could use this against you does not mean that you should not use this tool either. What it does mean is that you need to have a great iCloud password that you don't use any place else. Because in all the demonstrations of how this is pulled off, it all depends crucially on somebody knowing your iCloud password. Nobody broke into Apple. Nobody hacked Apple servers. Nobody found out your iCloud password from Apple. Nobody found it out from hacking your Mac either. The way they found it out is that they hacked some other account. It's your Gmail or LinkedIn or Dropbox or whatever, some other account that got hacked. And they assume that because you're lazy, you're gonna use the same username and password everywhere. So they just try that same password with your iCloud account. And sure enough, they get in, hey, let's lock this guy's Mac and you know, extort some money from him. So the, the, the lesson to take away from this is to not use the same password in multiple places. And this is what, you know, I've preached about backups and I've preached about passwords. And, and these are like two of the things that I just, you know, everybody for crying out loud, please do this. Don't use the same password in two different places. It is so, so dangerous. So... You, you use an app that will generate passwords randomly for you and remember them for you and, and fill them in for you. So you relieve your brain of that effort of having to do that and just use a different password for iCloud. And then you, you are like 99.9% .9 protected against that exploit. And I, I feel quite confident that by the time anybody you know, figures out that fraction of a percent that Apple will have plugged the hole in the first place. So it's another one of those things where I'm not going to tell you don't use that feature. Some people will say don't use that feature. I'm going to say don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, you have to at some point take take your own security into your own hands and um, and do the right thing. It still fascinates me. That people, I've had people in in the last the last month argue with me that no, I don't want that complex a password. You know, give me you know a, a password. Give me my password should be pineapple, and it's like no, it should not. You know, stop it. You know, you just I mean buy one password or invest in a dictionary and a highlighter or something. But for heaven's sake, you know, would you please stop this because. You, it, it's not just it, in in a lot of cases. It's not just your data that you're endangering. It's other people's data because you have other people's data on your device. So yeah. I, I, I'm with you. I you know I could we could both go off running off on a screaming tangent about that. But but it's just it's as, the 21st century. Wake up. Yeah, and as as you follow up to this, you know I I, I a, little, a little earlier before that edit we uh, I went down on a little sort of uh, I, my my brain went on the garden path to something or other and uh, I went down kind of the wrong path but I was there, there was this this separate thing which was this 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 exploit where somebody basically showed how you can you know you can download this malware app that will expose the contents of your iCloud keychain and okay again that's a thing that Apple should have fixed I'm sure they will fix it but that doesn't the the fact that if you installed malware that were able to read your iCloud keychain doesn't mean you should no longer use iCloud keychain. What it means is you should be careful not to install <laughs> malware. Yeah. I mean, it's like you have to you have to manually bypass a couple of Apple's security checks where there are warnings saying, "Hey, are you really really sure you want to open this because we're not sure and we're not responsible if anything goes wrong." Are you really sure you want to do this? And after you agree to a couple of those, then you can run an app like this. And then, like, man, that's on you. If you if you if you don't read the thing on the screen, and like, if you if you intentionally jump through these extra hoops to bypass Apple's security warnings, then I I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for you. They're there for a reason. So 
it, it is, you know, it's not that there isn't a problem, but you have to have to think about the correct response to the problem in in a way that makes sense. And it's uh, to, to, to take another example. I mean, okay, so if I leave five hundred dollars in cash sitting on my car seat, and I lock it. Okay, I've taken one precaution, but maybe not enough. Maybe I need to throw a sweater over the five hundred dollars cash. Yeah. If if I leave it sitting there and leave the door open or the windows down, well then come on, you know, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm sorry, you know, you just you just you're just being stupid and you're asking for it. So, what you could do is uh, you go ahead and put the sweater over the five hundred dollars, um, but just tweet the location of your car because. <laughs> Because concerned citizens on Twitter will want to help you. They will rush in to, to guard and protect your car. I mean, I know I would. Yes. Because I care. Yes. And, and the lesson here is, you know, to definitely put $500 cash on your seat and tweet the location. And <laughs> That's right. Maybe you're maybe not use this water. Uh, Joe, I don't know how we got down that that path, but it's, it was a good one. It was it was very informative because yeah. it is something that's been in the news recently, and, and I think a lot of people were wondering about it. And I'd much rather hear your advice than some others. Um, but but let's get back to the book. Um, yeah. it, it is available now. What kind of pricing do we have for this book, and how about the upgrades and all that since it's a new edition? Yeah, so it's a $15 book. And um, as of the date that we're recording this, we have not decided yet on upgrade pricing. Um, I, I, I recently got some feedback from uh, from someone who said that the the, uh, the the previous version's upgrade price he, he thought was much too high. So um, I said I will look into this carefully, and I, I I want to make it tempting to buy upgrades. I don't want to make it so expensive that you're like ah I'll wait till next year. No, I, I really want you to upgrade. So um, I'm going to try to make it tempting, but we haven't decided on the upgrade pricing yet. Um, but basically, if you have a previous edition, any previous edition of the iCloud book, you check the, you click the little uh, ebook extras thing on the cover, and uh, that will take you to, paid, to, a, to a page that will tell you what the upgrade story is. And uh, assuming you've opted in to get our uh, emails, uh, you'll get an email from me as well with the upgrade story. Um, and uh, we may even offer like a little a little special bundle of take control of iCloud and take control of the cloud because um, when when the recent uh, new edition of take control of the cloud came up, um, there was a lot of confusion. I mean, a lot of people were saying, I don't understand. I went to my fifth edition of take control of iCloud and I clicked ebook extras and it didn't say anything about a new edition. I'm like, that was a totally different book. That was not the same book. And I, I mean, I'm not just talking about a few people, but a lot of people got the cloud and iCloud confused. I probably could have done a better job of um, of making that clear. But um, on the other hand, I've I've learned that you know those two topics kind of go together. So why not offer a bundle too, and we'll just we'll settle it that way. So uh, we will we will do that as well. And you're right. If anybody that, well, no, that's not fair. A lot of it's easy to get confused because I, sure. iCloud is a subset of the cloud, but the cloud has a whole lot more op, uh, components than you know than just iCloud. So right, and uh, there are there are certainly some people who use very little of the cloud other than iCloud, and so that might be really their ex their main experience of the cloud. But but as you say, yeah, the cloud is kind of, you know, this this gigantic um, concept, and iCloud is just one tiny little corner of it. Right. So takecontrolbooks.com, of course, is right where on. you go to get all this. Uh, it is Take Control of iCloud, sixth edition, yep. by Mr. Joe Kissel. Joe, thank you. Th thank you for all the work. I mean, really, I say sure. that, I think, so often, but I don't want people to, to miss the fact that you do a lot of research. You don't just, again, slap these books together. There's a lot of research that goes into this, and so, it's, it's folks, it's well worth your time and your money to check it out, believe me. Joe, we'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. We certainly will. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Go check out Take Control of iCloud, Take Control of the Cloud, Take Control of Anything. Joe's got you covered. Until the next time, thanks for watching. 
visit macvoices.com for show notes, links to subscribe, and to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, the Mac Voices blog, the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and on Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard that helps you do more with your Apple tech. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. 